confirmed evidence of cannibalism in this case. It comes from Jeffrey Dahmer himself. Earlier this week, police discovered a grisly collection of skulls, torsos, and other body parts in a refrigerator and a large drum inside Dahmer's apartment. When I finally got enough facts to convince me that he was a murderer, I began to think of how I could have been involved with this, how I could have uh, seen any signs uh, throughout his life that he was coming to this point. Jeffrey Dahmer confessed to the killings, but pleaded not guilty on the grounds of insanity. After a 19-day trial, the jury returned their verdict. Jeffrey Dahmer was found sane and therefore guilty. It sort of inferred that Jeff was in his right mind at all times, and therefore the logical inference would be uh, that people would think that he's evil, he's a monster, he's just totally perverse, evil person. This is Doylestown, where we first moved. Jeff was six years old, and uh, Jeff was starting to get very shy at this age and at this location. I didn't think too much of it because I was very shy when I was uh, young, and uh, I didn't really attach too much significance to it at that time. Jeff had a baby brother. Uh, shortly after we moved here to Doylestown and concurrently with that a lot of problems developed uh, with respect to physical and mental uh, illnesses of my uh, former wife. As a result a lot of the caretaking duties fell to me and uh, we had uh, some good times here. Uh, every Sunday morning uh, Jeff and I and his dog Frisky would walk over to a neighboring farm and collect eggs, about a two mile walk, and then we would return and uh, I'd fix breakfast for everyone. It was sort of a tradition. People paint him out to be a loner. I wouldn't say he was a loner. He attached himself to my crowd of friends. I wouldn't say he was a close friend. I wouldn't say he had any close friends. But he kept to himself sometimes when he wanted to, and other times he could be very outgoing and get involved with things. But he wasn't your average student. Looking back, uh, I cannot really think of anything in that period of time that we would do differently. He appeared to be very shy. We addressed that question with his teacher uh, several times. And I really can't think of anything that we would do differently except if I had it in me, I would be able to uh, draw out his thinking more. About his home, um, we never went to Jeff's house. We never went in his home. And that was because of we had heard from neighbors, uh, students, fellow students that lived in the neighborhood, that his parents fought bitterly and that his house was not a place you want to spend any time because of his parents. You know, Jeff really didn't invite people in. He didn't invite you over much. And I think in a way, maybe he felt embarrassed about the situation at home that his parents fought so much. Well, it just didn't seem like my parents really liked each other too much. It just made me feel on edge, unsure of the solidity of the family. Mom was, was comforting when she, you know, could be. She was sick a lot during that time. was quite an enigma. He could make people laugh. 
But what made him different about that was that he always made himself the target of ridicule in doing that. He would always set himself up in these very bizarre situations and often people laugh because they were so embarrassed and embarrassed both for him and for themselves. At the age of 12, 13 or 14, Jeff liked to tell jokes. He liked to act goofy, just like I did at that age. Now, when we get into 15, 16, that's where the, the marriage was starting to really deteriorate. Things were getting very serious. I could see a darkening of his mood. I attributed that to the divorce, the disruption, the shattering of his family. I was extremely occupied with taking care of the home, the medical and psychological problems, so it was, and work. So it was really, I mean, not to rationalize, but it was really diff a very difficult time to emotionally stay in touch with my son, Jeff. One of the strongest memories I have of Jeff was that it seemed to me that he was drunk a lot. Um, and beginning at a very young age, maybe about, I first remember at about 15 or 16, and especially at the age of 16 was when I noticed that he was actually drinking in the open in school in the classroom. Um, and both that both astonished me and also the fact that nobody seemed to notice or care, I found quite amazing at the time. It was on this Bath Road where we moved, and uh, Jeff and I participated with a lot of uh, activities and events. We planted all the evergreens on the property together, planted a garden together every year. But it was at this time where uh, he roamed around these roads on his bicycle with garbage bags looking for uh, animal remains animals that had been hit by cars, such as dogs and raccoons, and took them back into the woods, unknown to any of us, and dissected them just to see what was on their inside. Jeff also had a, uh, what you'd call a pet cemetery. It was a little area where he would put little crosses and uh, remains of chipmunks and so forth, and it was across the street uh, up in the neighbor's woods. So it was about this time that things were starting to develop apparently in his mind, taking a bizarre turn. At the age of 18, just before his parents' divorce, he was left alone in the house. He picked up a hitchhiker, invited him home, and killed him. Remains of the body lay buried under the house for 12 years. This first crime and all those that followed, Jeffrey Dahmer eventually confessed to Detective Kennedy. I think he did feel truly abandoned. And when he had the first individual or first victim with him, they were together drinking. And when this individual decided to leave, I think Jeff just wanted to stop him from leaving. I don't believe in my, in my mind that he premeditated to murder this individual. But when he hit him with the barbell, um, it was done while he was intoxicated. Doesn't excuse it, but I, I don't believe there was any premeditation there. I should have found decent interests spend my energy on. If I had done that, I, I wouldn't be here today. I, I'd be living pretty decently. But that night in Ohio, that's when everything went down the tubes, really. That one impulsive night. So nothing's really been normal ever since then. Jeffrey Dahmer explained these thoughts and feelings in a recorded interview with the psychologist, Dr. Kenneth Smale. Their conversations included Jeffrey Dahmer's childhood, and adolescent years. In Jeff's early adolescence, he had developed these thoughts and fantasy toward uh, uh, sexual urges of, of men and also uh, 
within that thinking also was urges to have sex with um, with very passive and, and, and deceased people. Um, he had planned or had fantasies of, of hurting other people. He gave an account of lying in wait for a jogger to go by and he had a baseball bat and the plan was to to club the person at least unconscious, if not to kill him, and then to have some sort of sexual contact. On that day, the jogger didn't go by, so there was no consummated act. But he had those thoughts and urges before he actually killed his first victim. I uh, sort of wrapped myself up in a fantasy world during the latter part of elementary school days. Never was interested in what seems to me the 99% of the population of the world is and leading a family life, you know. Jeffrey Dahmer graduated, but expressed no interest in his future. I tried to instill a sense of direction into him, but it must have seemed terribly irrelevant to him to be talking to Jeff about that when he had recently committed a murder. His father and stepmother saw the army as a possible solution. In those days, we still believed the army could make a man out of a boy. We didn't see Jeff then for the next two and a half years. We, we corresponded with him. When Jeff did get out of the service, he came home. Uh, he had a wonderful work ethic. He was really trying, but he soon slipped back into the old pattern of drinking. Out of frustration, after many, many attempts of trying to dry him up, get him psychological care, help him out, we said to him, why don't you go to Grandma's, think life over, and decide, Jeff, what you want to do. We'll help you, we'll support you, but just please, please understand you can't continue living with us this way. In January 1982, Jeffrey Dahmer left for his grandmother's house in Milwaukee. Lionel hoped that her influence might give him a sense of purpose and direction. Because he loved his grandmother and the fact that she was this religious, devoutly religious woman who did impart some of her religious values on him, and he saw them as good, strong values, something to, be, to take hold of. He realized that his grandmother's values and his grandmother's religion did not accept homosexuality. And uh, he did quote to me something from the Bible that talks about homosexuality as being, uh, well, unnatural and something to be banished. He didn't agree with that and he had trouble with that, you know, reconciling that with, you know, how he felt about his grandmother. After deciding that he wasn't going to be saved by religion, he wholeheartedly embraced the homosexual culture. He kept it hidden from his grandmother but would take the bus and hang out in the gay area of town. He was not just controlling urges to have homosexual contact with other people. For him, his sexuality was not only homosexual expression, but it also was an interest in necrophilia and a profound interest in control of other people. So that from him, he was controlling the whole package and that release of any one of those things meant the whole thing came out. In November 1987, Jeffrey Dahmer took a man back to a rented room in Milwaukee. He woke up to find he had beaten the man to death. Nine years after his first murder, he had killed again. That started everything again. I was just interested in, in laying with people for the night up to that point. Something broke through and I started the long slide down. It was an incessant never-ending desire to have someone at whatever cost, someone good-looking, and uh, it just filled my thoughts all day long. By the spring of 1990, Jeffrey Dahmer had moved out of his grandmother's house and was living by himself in an apartment in downtown Milwaukee. Every day, he caught a bus to the local chocolate factory, where he worked as a shop floor worker. Lionel remained in touch with his son. They met up in the fall in Milwaukee at the grandmother's house. But by that time, 
Jeffrey Dahmer had killed five people, three of them in that house. In uh, Thanksgiving of 1990, uh, we made our usual trip to Milwaukee to visit my mother. I took along a camcorder just to preserve us on, on uh, camera. I took pictures of uh, my mother and Jeff. So what have you been doing lately? Working and working and working and working? Working next week, starting uh, Monday. I go back to work Sunday nights. Oh, and, boy. Uh, so you go back to work this Sunday night? Great. Yeah. You look so good, though. You look nice and trim. Oh, that's good to hear. You I look like you're working out. No. Aren't you? Oh, I haven't worked Looking out. Looking at I've Jeff, he looks entirely normal, no. uh, clean oh, cut, downtown. very nicely dressed. Uh, responds very sociably. You still keep up your membership there, though. Yeah, it's only There's nothing yeah, to it's indicate, really, uh, that he had recently killed people. No, I've been surviving on McDonald's food mm -hmm. for, you know, since I moved down there. Mm -hmm. I really could not really see how I or anyone could could think that he had invo been involved with, with murder or, or even something less than that. There is just no indication. I don't think. I couldn't see anything. Could you, honestly? I... And, of course, you woke up at, what, 8 this morning? Right. And then you, you cleaned up your apartment really nicely so you could show us what it looks like? Yeah, I want you to come over <laughs> if you feel like it. It's, it. I haven't done any dusting or vacuuming or anything. I do that on Sundays. But... Uh -huh. uh, as I was talking with Jeff and trying to get a feel for why he was killing people, um, some of the things that he brought up was, the first point was that er all of the other people who he tried to have a close personal relationship with would eventually leave, and he didn't want them to leave. So by killing them, he ensured that they were no longer going to go anywhere. Because I used to staff for the other part was that ever since he was a small child, when he found out that he was gay, what is this was a part of his life that he knew was not acceptable to his mom or dad. He knew was not acceptable to his school or his religion, so he kept it very secret. And in a way, Jeff felt that his secret life, his gay life, gave him power in a way that it was something that nobody else that knew him knew about. It was his own little world that he had a certain amount of control over, and he enjoyed that. Do you know who the other person is there, that beautiful blonde sitting on the couch? Yawning. And That's right. And who is this? Yeah. That's cousin Jeff. Yes. He's <laughs> talking. <laughs> Looks like a bunch of satisfied people sitting around here. Yes. I think you can't deny the fact that that, that he was pursuing pleasures when he was doing this. But to a large extent, Jeff had nothing else going in his life. The relationships with people meant nothing to him. Um, he had no capacity to have contacts with other people that, such that, that he would find some reward or pleasure or comfort in those relationships. So that the, the variety of spheres of most people's lives um, wasn't what he experienced. It, this is all that he had. The need for human contact that contributed to him killing went beyond the dismembering and saving of body parts. It led to him eating them. The reason why he killed people was to keep them with him. And now, by eating the body, not only was he keeping them with him, but he was actually eating them and making this person part of him. So they were with him forever. They were one with Jeff. Uh, Although it sounds bizarre and incredible, at the time that he told me the story, I must admit it made perfect sense to me. I don't know if that means that I'm crazy too, but although I didn't agree with any of it, I mean, it seemed like a logical succession to what he did. Jeffrey Dahmer's ultimate plan was to build a shrine with the skulls and bones of those he had killed. Jeff described a shrine that he had vision making, and he had the component parts to it. It consisted of skeletal, a recreated skeleton and, and skulls. And he envisioned it as a place where he could go and sit before. And it would be a time when he could 
get in touch with something larger than himself, that um, he could go and, and feel comfortable, that um, it would give him, it would give his life some meaning. So that in my assessment, it was a, there is an aspect of this that is a quest for spirituality. Thinking about what Jeff has done in these bizarre thoughts, actions, the killings, uh, I reconcile that in my mind with loving him and continuing to think of him as my son, a loving son, and having love toward him by viewing that side of him as something which he absolutely allowed to be out of control or was in fact controlling him. The pace of his killing accelerated. In the summer of 1991, in just three weeks, he murdered another four men. He had by now killed 17 people. It's very clear at the end that he was utterly, absolutely out of control with all of this. The bodies truly were piling up, literally were piling up. He got massive stuff on. He, at one point, had one in the bathtub and one hanging from the shower, and he um, slept with one in the bed next to him for a while simply because he didn't have time to dispose of it. You know, it, it really points to somebody not who was in control of that, but who, in a sense, was being controlled by that. Jeffrey Dahmer was finally discovered at his apartment, surrounded by the evidence. He was arrested and charged with murder. At the first meeting with Jeff after he was arrested, I held him close and uh, I cried for about a minute and Jeff did not show any emotion at all. And I didn't really realize it at the time. Uh, I talked with him about it afterwards, but I didn't really realize it that he wasn't showing any emotion at the time because I was shaking so much. I thought he was shaking too. In January 1992, the trial opened in Milwaukee. It was frightening. It was traumatic to have the victims' families to our left and uh, there were activist groups to our right, and people stared at us. In fact, some sweet old lady came and sat down beside me, and someone came over and whispered in her ear who we were and made her move. It was a do-and-a-don't situation. We didn't want to be there, but we had to be there. While the details of Jeffrey Dahmer's crimes became widely known, he himself had not been seen publicly since his arrest. Among those waiting in court for his first appearance was the author, Brian Masters. There was an enormous feeling of hatred, resentment, anger, as if they could have, they would have torn him limb from limb if they could have done. Because he'd not only bereaved them, but he had removed from them the object of their grief. They had no bodies to grieve over. All right, please. What this man had done, he had the ultimately ridiculous notion of taking somebody's will away by drilling a hole in the head of a live man who'd had sat too much to drink and, and was drugged and pouring acid into the hole in the head in order to deprive him of that part of his brain which would wish to have a will of its own to leave. And he hoped that he would keep people in this way. These are the things this man had done. And what we saw was somebody who looked like a tennis player, somebody who looked fairly studious, very quiet, unsmiling, no sense of life to him. He seemed to be a whole jigsaw puzzle with the central point missing and irrecoverable. Jeffrey Dahmer's guilt or innocence depended on his state of mind at the time of his crimes. The defense argued that because he was a necrophiliac, he was not able to control his actions. The prosecution rejected this. What this defendant did, he decided, this man that sits in this courtroom now, 
for his sexual <laughs> satisfaction. His sexual satisfaction killed Stephen Hicks. I thought the rhetoric at the trial took a very bizarre turn in that it was presented to the jury as though um, killing and eating and masturbating over dead bodies and having sex in the viscera of the bodies was just another sexual choice that Jeff had made. Um, and it was clear to me reading his very horrifying confession to the police that it was anything but that. Um, that the killings got more desperate for him, not calculating. If you just look at the totality of what Jeff Dahmer did, obviously you got to say he's freaking nuts. I mean, only a nut would do this. Only a crazy person would do what he did. But if you look at the whole story, the whole scenario of Jeff Dahmer, from his earliest sexual awakenings and dabbling and cutting up of roadkill animals that he found through his experiences with which I would call an accidental death and bath although he would have had to pay some some consequence for it to his second death which kind of triggered the whole thing again here in Milwaukee it's very logical to me how he got into this situation um, when you would talk to Jeff Dahmer you definitely would not get the idea that you were talking to a nut in a special verdict, question number one. At the time the crime was committed in count two of the information, did the defendant, Jeffrey L. Dahmer, have a mental disease? Answer, no. Question number two need not be answered. On each count of murder, the jury rejected the claim that Jeffrey Dahmer had a mental disease and declared him legally sane. Uh, While Dr. Smale agreed with the verdict, he admits that the language of the law fails to truly describe Jeffrey Dahmer. You all agree that I have accurate... It seemed to me like that he had seen madness, um, in, in, in a layman's sense, that he had seen madness. I don't know how to say that professionally, but that, that, um, that he had been someplace and had partially come back, but had been someplace that, that others wouldn't go, couldn't go, um, uh, but haven't been. It now becomes the duty of the court to impose sentence in this case. The important point is that the sentence is structured in such a way that this defendant will never again see freedom. One of the implications for the, the jury's verdict here was that it was not the disease that was responsible for what he had done, but that Jeff had done it. The implication of that is, is that is that he is, remains one of us, that he is still within the bounds of humanity. And that, I think, is, is for me, more uncomfortable than the idea that he is, um, was insane and, and, and not responsible for what he did. Your Honor, it is over now. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I am so sorry for that, and sorry for everyone else that I have hurt. I have hurt my mother and father and stepmother. I love them all so very much. I hope that they will find the same peace I am looking for. After the trial, Teresa Smith, a sister of one of the victims, decided she wanted to speak with Lionel and Shari. Shari had made the first tentative move in the courtroom. Three years later, their conversations have developed into a friendship. You come very here. There you go. Thank you. You look very pretty. I appearance and I put myself in in their shoes. If that was my parents, they would be going through a lot. 
and the guilt is just overwhelming and you could see that and feel that when you talk to them. How are you doing? Yeah. Good to see you. It's good to see you She too. came bearing gifts. No kidding. What did you bring me? Oh, well, I it's brought... It's in my hand. Oh. I brought the kids. I don't hold them responsible for what Jeff did ever. Um, he was grown when he did this. Um, I, I talk about his life because I wanted to see what kind of upbringing he came from. In trying to come to terms with Eddie's death, Teresa felt she had to meet the man who had killed her brother. I wanted to know um, Eddie's last words because I wanted to know what mood my brother was in before uh, he took his life. Well, he said he was sorry when I first walked in there. That's the first thing he, he basically said to me, that he was sorry for killing him. And it was just pure selfishness on his part. And if he could do it all over, he wouldn't have did none of that. But he couldn't help himself. So... Mm -hmm. And stuff. I'm really glad to see you guys. Yeah, we are too. <laughs> We're glad you're... She is unlike any other person I know because I would have a very hard time forgiving anyone associated with someone who had done what Jeff did to my loved ones. I wish everything could be this peaceful. And I know. Friends would be nice, wow, wouldn't it? Here. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice to have your own private little island somewhere to escape? Yes. Just forget it all. You just understood that you had to move on and you had to understand. Otherwise, you would just stay in the past and I couldn't deal with that because just thinking about that hurt it even more. It's been three years and it still hurts, you know, but it doesn't hurt as much as I didn't before I knew them. How's your family doing? They're doing, they're doing well as well to be expected and stuff, you know, Good. and yours. Just getting by, right, <laughs> about the same. Yeah. I think he did what he could. You know, you can always look back and say, um, you know, you should have did this, and you should have did that, and you should have been aware of this. But you can't. And, you know, it's like I said, it's easier to look back and blame. It's harder to just go ahead and say, well, this is what will take it from there. A decision Jeffrey Dahmer has recently made has helped Lionel to look forwards. His son has chosen to be baptized. All my life I've tried to do practical things for Jeff to help him out when he's gotten into trouble and uh, maybe I wasn't just equipped to do that. But whatever the reason, uh, his recent baptism into Christ and his newfound faith is a comfort to me because I feel like I've had some part in doing that and it's very important to me. Perhaps the victim's families will come to believe that he does deserve the end reward. I can't forgive him right now, but uh, being the way I grew up and being a Christian, you know, you're supposed to. You never forget, but one of these days, um, you know, I might be able to do that and just let it go. Well, my opinion as a police officer is that it's easy to get religion when you're in jail. I mean, there's no place else to go. Um, but I also do believe, because I have a faith, that if he wants to live with himself, and this is a point that I tried to drive home to him when I was trying to get him to tell me about the homicides, was that he had to admit to God what he did, ask for forgiveness, make some amends, and that's the only way he would be able to live with himself. From my conversations with Jeff, I would say that he is genuinely reaching out and trying to embrace some religious aspects of life in order to make his life more bearable. He's there for the rest of his life. That is his home. That is where he's going to die. And um, to make amends with God is the right thing to do. And that's the only one who's going to forgive him for his sins. We have no right to say, oh, you can't be baptized. You know, who are we?
When I found out what Jeff had done, I could have just walked away and and forgotten about any type of uh, affiliation or duty. Uh, the reason I stayed with Jeff is that I identify so closely in his shyness, his feelings of an ineptness and inferiority. There is a very deep love there to try to do something to show the world what he really was like as a youth. In looking at what he had done as an adult, one would expect to find horrible secrets coming out of his childhood, um, perhaps abuse of various kinds. There simply was never any evidence to support those notions. He had an imperfect childhood. Many people do, and not anybody else comes to uh, an adult life and winds up killing people as Jeff has done. So while there may be contributing factors in his childhood, they certainly don't provide an answer as to why Jeff did what he did do. People want us to feel ashamed, and I think that's sad. I think that's incredibly sad that they want us to bear the shame for his crimes. Uh, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We're guilty of bearing the same last name. My husband had, gave him creation, it was part of his creation, but we have no reason to be ashamed. And, and I'm, I'm puzzled sometimes when people look at us as though we have not eaten enough dirt or paid a dear enough price because I dare any of them to walk in our shoes. It's amazing to me in, in 31 years, 31 short years, how I could create such hell for myself and everyone around me because I did it. It's my doing, my little horrid creation. You know, I mean, people can say, well, it was family pressures or it was mental disease, but the fact is that uh, I'm the one that did it. Very self-destructive life. <laughs>